Chapter Six of Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mr. Hindley came home to the funeral, and a thing that amazed us and set the neighbors gossiping right and left. He brought a wife with him. What she was and where she was born, he never informed us. Probably she had neither money nor name to recommend her, or he would scarcely have kept the union from his father. She was not one that would have disturbed the house much on her own account. Every object she saw, the moment she crossed the threshold, appeared to delight her, and every circumstance that took place about her, except the preparing for the burial and the presence of the mourners. I thought she was half silly, from her behaviour while that went on. She ran into her chamber and made me come with her, though I should have been dressing the children, and there she sat shivering and clasping her hands, and asking repeatedly, are they gone yet? Then she began describing with hysterical emotion the effect it produced on her to see black, and started, and trembled, and at last fell a-weeping, and when I asked what was the matter, answered she didn't know, but she felt so afraid of dying. I imagined her as little likely to die as myself. She was rather thin, but young, and fresh-complexioned, and her eyes sparkled as bright as diamonds. I did remark, to be sure, that mounting the stairs made her breathe very quick, that the least sudden noise set her all in a quiver, and that she coughed troublesomely sometimes, but I knew nothing of what these symptoms portended, and had no impulse to sympathise with her. We don't in general take to foreigners here, Mr. Lockwood, unless they take to us first. Young Earnshaw was altered considerably in the three years of his absence. He had grown sparer, and lost his colour, and spoke and dressed quite differently, and on the very day of his return he told Joseph and me we must thenceforth quarter ourselves in the back kitchen, and leave the house for him. Indeed, he would have carpeted and papered a small spare room for a parlour, but his wife expressed such pleasure at the white floor and huge glowing fireplace, at the pewter dishes and elf case, and dog kennel, and the wide space there was to move about in where they usually sat, that he thought it unnecessary to her comfort, and so dropped the intention. She expressed pleasure, too, at finding a sister among her new acquaintance, and she prattled to Catherine, and kissed her, and ran about with her, and gave her quantities of presents at the beginning. Her affection tired very soon, however, and when she grew peevish, Hindley became tyrannical. A few words from her, evincing a dislike to Heathcliff, were enough to rouse in him all his old hatred of the boy. He drove him from their company to the servants, deprived him of the instructions of the curate, and insisted that he should labour out of doors instead, compelling him to do so as hard as any other lad on the farm. Heathcliff bore his degradation pretty well at first, because Cathy taught him what she learnt, and worked or played with him in the fields. They both promised fair to grow up as rude as savages, the young master being entirely negligent how they behaved, and what they did, so they kept clear of him. He would not have even seen after their going to church on Sundays, only Joseph and the curate reprimanded his carelessness when they absented themselves, and that reminded him to order Heathcliff a flogging, and Catherine a fast from dinner or supper. But it was one of their chief amusements to run away to the moors in the morning and remain there all day, and the after-punishment grew a mere thing to laugh at. The curate might set as many chapters as he pleased for Catherine to get by heart, and Joseph might thrash Heathcliff till his arm ached. They forgot everything the minute they were together again, at least the minute they had contrived some naughty plan of revenge, and many a time I've cried to myself to watch them growing more reckless daily, and I not daring to speak a syllable, for fear of losing the small power I still retained over the unfriended creatures. One Sunday evening it chanced that they were banished from the sitting-room, for making a noise or a light offence of the kind, and when I went to call them for supper I could discover them nowhere. We searched the house above and below, and the yard and stables— they were invisible, and at last Hindley, in a passion, told us to bolt the doors, and swore nobody should let them in that night. The household went to bed, and I, too, anxious to lie down, opened my lattice and put my head out to hearken, though it rained, determined to admit them in spite of the prohibition, should they return. In a while I distinguished steps coming up the road, and the light of a lantern glimmered through the gate. I threw a shawl over my head, and ran to prevent them from waking Mr. Earnshaw by knocking. There was Heathcliff, by himself. It gave me a start to see him alone. "'Where is Miss Catherine?' 
I cried hurriedly. No accident, I hope. At Thrushcross Grange, he answered. And I would have been there too, but they had not the manners to ask me to stay. Well, you will catch it, I said. You'll never be content till you're sent about your business. What in the world led you wandering to Thrushcross Grange? Let me get off my wet clothes, and I'll tell you all about it, Nelly, he replied. I bid him beware of rousing the master, and while he undressed and I waited to put out the candle, he continued. Cathy and I escaped from the wash-house to have a ramble at liberty, and getting a glimpse of the Grange lights, we thought we would just go and see whether the Lintons passed their Sunday evenings standing shivering in corners, while their father and mother sat eating and drinking and singing and laughing and burning their eyes out before the fire. Do you think they do? Or reading sermons and being catechized by their manservant, and set to learn a column of scripture names if they don't answer properly? Probably not, I responded. They are good children, no doubt, and don't deserve the treatment you receive for your bad conduct. Don't cant, Nelly, he said. Nonsense. We ran from the top of the heights to the park without stopping, Catherine completely beaten in the race because she was barefoot. You'll have to seek for her shoes in the bog tomorrow. We crept through a broken hedge, groped our way up the path, and planted ourselves on a flower plot under the drawing room window. The light came from thence. They had not put up the shutters, and the curtains were only half closed. Both of us were able to look in by standing on the basement and clinging to the ledge, and we saw, ah, it was beautiful, a splendid place carpeted with crimson and crimson-covered chairs and tables, and a pure white ceiling bordered by gold, a shower of glass drops hanging in silver chains from the center and shimmering with little soft tapers. Old Mr. and Mrs. Linton were not there. Edgar and his sisters had it entirely to themselves. Shouldn't they have been happy? We should have thought ourselves in heaven. And now, guess what your good children were doing. Isabella, I believe she is eleven, a year younger than Cathy, lay screaming at the farther end of the room, shrieking as if witches were running red-hot needles into her. Edgar stood on the hearth weeping silently, and in the middle of the table sat a little dog, shaking its paw and yelping, which from their mutual accusations we understood they had nearly pulled in two between them. The idiots! That was their pleasure, to quarrel who should hold a heap of warm hair, and each begin to cry because both, after struggling to get it, refused to take it. We laughed outright at the petted things. We did despise them. When would you catch me wishing to have what Catherine wanted, or find us by ourselves seeking entertainment in yelling and sobbing and rolling on the ground, divided by the whole room? I'd not exchange for a thousand lives my condition here for Edgar Linton's at Thrushcross Grange, not if I might have the privilege of flinging Joseph off the highest gable and painting the house front with Hindley's blood. Hush, hush, I interrupted. Still you have not told me, Heathcliff, how Catherine is left behind. I told you we laughed, he answered. The Lintons heard us, and with one accord they shot like arrows to the door. There was silence, and then a cry, Oh, Mama, Mama, oh, Papa, oh, Mama, come here, oh, Papa, oh. They really did howl out something in that way. We made frightful noises to terrify them still more, and then we dropped off the ledge, because somebody was drawing the bars, and we felt we had better flee. I had Cathy by the hand and was urging her on, when all at once she fell down. Run, Heathcliff, run, she whispered. They have let the bulldog loose, and he holds me. The devil had seized her ankle, Nelly. I heard his abominable snorting. She did not yell out. No, she would have scorned to do it if she had been spitted on the horns of a mad cow. I did, though. I vociferated curses enough to annihilate any fiend in Christendom, and I got a stone and thrust it between his jaws and tried with all my might to cram it down his throat. A beast of a servant came up with a lantern at last, shouting, Keep fast, Skulker, keep fast. He changed his note, however, when he saw Skulker's game. The dog was throttled off, his huge purple tongue hanging half a foot out of his mouth and his pendant lips streaming with bloody slaver. The man took Cathy up. She was sick, not from fear, I'm certain, but from pain. He carried her in. I followed, grumbling execrations and vengeance. What pray, Robert? Hallooed Linton from the entrance. 
Skulker has caught a little girl, sir, he replied. And there's a lad here, he added, making a clutch at me, who looks an out and outer. Very like the robbers were for putting them through the window to open the doors to the gang after all were asleep, that they might murder us at their ease. Hold your tongue, you foul-mouthed thief, you. You shall go to the gallows for this. Mr. Linton, sir, don't lay by your gun. No, no, Robert, said the old fool. The rascals knew that yesterday was my rent day. They thought to have me cleverly. Come in, or furnish them a reception. There, John, fasten the chain. Give Skulker some water, Jenny. To be at a magistrate in his stronghold, and on the Sabbath, too. Where will their insolence stop? Oh, my dear Mary, look here. Don't be afraid, it is but a boy. Yet the villain scowls so plainly in his face. Would it not be kindness the country to hang him at once, before he shows his nature and acts as well as features? He pulled me under the chandelier, and Mrs. Linton placed her spectacles on her nose and raised her hands in horror. The cowardly children crept nearer also, Isabella lisping. Frightful thing! Put him in the cellar, papa. He is exactly like the son of the fortune-teller that stole my tame pheasant. Isn't he, Edgar? While they examined me, Cathy came round. She heard the last speech and laughed. Edgar Linton, after an inquisitive stare, collected sufficient wit to recognize her. They see us at church, you know, though we seldom meet them elsewhere. That's Miss Earnshaw, he whispered to his mother. And look how Skulker has been there. Our foot bleeds. Miss Earnshaw? Nonsense, cried the dame. Miss Earnshaw's currying the country with a gypsy. And yet, my dear, the child is in mourning, surely it is, and she might be lamed for life. What culpable carelessness in her brother, exclaimed Mr. Linton, turning from me to Catherine. I've understood from Shielders. That was the curate, sir. That he lets her grow up in absolute heathenism. But who is this? Where did she pick up this companion? Oh, I declare he is that strange acquisition my late neighbour made in his journey to Liverpool. A little Lascar, or an American, or Spanish castaway. A wicked boy at all events, remarked the old lady. And quite unfit for a decent house. Did you notice his language, Linton? I'm shocked that my children should have heard it. I recommenced cursing, don't be angry, Nelly, and so Robert was ordered to take me off. I refused to go without Cathy. He dragged me into the garden, pushed the lantern into my hand, assured me that Mr. Earnshaw should be informed of my behavior, and, bidding me march directly, secured the door again. The curtains were still looped up at one corner, and I resumed my station as spy, because if Catherine had wished to return, I intended shattering their great glass panes to a million of fragments unless they let her out. She sat on the sofa quietly. Mrs. Linton took off the grey cloak of the dairymaid, which we had borrowed for our excursion, shaking her head and expostulating with her, I suppose. She was a young lady, and they made a distinction between her treatment and mine. Then the woman-servant brought a basin of warm water and washed her feet, and Mr. Linton mixed a tumbler of negus, and Isabella emptied a plateful of cakes into her lap, and Edgar stood gaping at a distance. Afterwards they dried and combed her beautiful hair, and gave her a pair of enormous slippers, and wheeled her to the fire. And I left her, as merry as she could be, dividing her food between the little dog and Skulker, whose nose she pinched as he ate, and kindling a spark of spirit in the vacant blue eyes of the Lintons, a dim reflection from her own enchanting face. I saw they were full of stupid admiration. She is so immeasurably superior to them to everybody on earth. Is she not, Nelly? There will more come of this business than you reckon on, I answered, covering him up and extinguishing the light. You are incurable, Heathcliff, and Mr. Hindley will have to proceed to extremities, see if he won't. My words came truer than I desired. The luckless adventure made Earnshaw furious, and then Mr. Linton, to mend matters, paid us a visit himself on the morrow, and read the young master such a lecture on the road he guided his family that he was stirred to look about him in earnest. Heathcliff received no flogging, but he was told that the first word he spoke to Miss Catherine should ensure a dismissal, and Mrs. Earnshaw undertook to keep her sister-in-law in due restraint when she returned home, 
employing art, not force. With force, she would have found it impossible. End of chapter 6